In the 21st century, those who change the world are those who change the culture. They get people in sync, lead tribes, create movements, and generate an energy field where ordinary people achieve extraordinary results. the things that I think is interesting and different between nice and kind is nice is easy for us usually, fairly easily. We can paste on a false smile and we can say something nice. Being kind takes candor often. And so I've just created my own definition of candor uh, to help people think about this kindness. So candor for me is my willingness to be uncomfortable for your benefit. And that's a kind person, a person who is willing to be uncomfortable for someone else's benefit. And so nice is easy. Kind sometimes requires candor, sometimes requires discomfort, but those are the people for whom we hold out the greatest trust, the greatest respect, the greatest love, is people who are willing to be uncomfortable for our benefit. I'm Aga Bayer, and this is the Culture Lab podcast, where you will find ideas and inspiration on how to harness the power of team and organizational culture. I talk to leadership thinkers, culture experts, entrepreneurs, and all sorts of movers and shakers, and together we explore the fascinating topic of culture, leadership, and personal growth. If you like what you hear, subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. Or better yet, write a review on iTunes and share the podcast with your followers and friends on social media. For more, check out our archive at www.agabayer.com slash podcast. Hi, and welcome to episode 45. My guest today is Dr. Leanne Davy. She's the New York Times bestselling author and a regular contributor to the Harvard Business Review and Quartz magazine. Her new book, The Good Fight, Use Productive Conflict to Get Your Team and Your Organization Back on Track, was released in March this year. And I have to tell you, it's probably the best book that I've read on conflict. You'll hear us talk about how paradoxically excessive focus on happiness in the workplace can actually hurt performance and about the importance of normalizing conflict in the workplace and also about the things that you can do to deal with conflict in a more effective way. So now, without further ado, here is Leanne Davy. Leanne, welcome to Culture Lab. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you. I'm very, very glad that you could join us. And I'm really excited about our conversation. Um, before we dive into it, I would just like to ask you to briefly introduce yourself to our listeners. Absolutely. So, hi, I'm Leanne Davy, And by background, I have a background in organizational psychology. And my passion is really helping leaders to deal with all the messy people stuff so that they can get back to business. <laughs> I love the way you put it, the messy people stuff. I think we're, we're in the same business. <laughs> Definitely. Um, and I'm really curious, you know, how you ended up doing what you're doing. Um, so, you know, when we rewind to your early childhood and early cultural influences, um, what do you think were the influences that shaped you as a person? There are probably a couple that are really important to me. So the first is that uh, my parents uh, built curiosity into me from a very mm -hmm. early age. So while uh, so I, I grew up in the 70s, and most people talked about healthy families as sitting down together around a dinner table, uh, and, and my family ate every dinner in front of the television. And we watched <laughs> the local news. We watched North American news. We watched um, the public broadcaster uh, in the US, uh, their news reporting magazine show. And the deal was that uh, there was a full set of Encyclopedia Britannica and an mm -hmm. atlas in the room with us. So as you were listening, if there was 
uh, an issue you didn't understand, you were expected to put down your dinner, get up, get the encyclopedia. Really? Yeah. Or if there was a country you didn't know, you were expected mm-hmm. to set your plate down, go get the atlas, find it. So I love it. It was, it was the very, equivalent of, of Googling it back then, right? <laughs> and so now I'm terrible with Googling things in the middle of a meal because... Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I think for a lot of people, they think phones are destroying it. And I'm saying, no, no, it's just making it more convenient for me to do what I've done my entire life. So that curiosity that my parents baked into me is has been important to me my whole life. I'm just fascinated by the world. And then probably the one that led uh, to my career most is when I was very little, two or three years old, my favorite ch- children's show had a little feature in it every episode with a documentary about a factory. So here's how crayons are made, or here's how mm-hmm. cotton swabs or tires or bicycles. And I loved that show. And to this day, I still <laughs> like documentaries about factories. Yeah. And that was when I got really interested in business. And it was just mm. over time when I started to be interested in the humans in the factory as opposed to the machines themselves. Although mm. I think only because I had an aptitude for the people side and not so much for the engineering side. But to this day, if I can get a chance to tour a factory, I'm there in a heartbeat. Seriously? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I've been a mile underground in a uh, copper mine. I've wow. been to the factory where they manufacture Viagra. I've been <laughs> in New Zealand to a Cadbury chocolate factory. I, I just, if I can get into a factory, uh, I'm a very happy girl. Fantastic. You know, this is actually one of my early memories as well, visiting factories, but for an entirely different reason. I um, basically grew up in in the same time that you did, and it was behind the Iron Curtain, though. So yeah. the reason that we were visiting factories was that, you know, communism and socialism of that time really wanted to highlight the, the lives of the workers. And so we did a lot of that um, as children. And I think that I have a associated a little bit with that time. So I have yeah. to say that I, I don't find visiting factories particularly exciting, but I can yeah. see where you're coming from and why why that would be interesting. So you are always curious, always curious about people. And um, I can see how clearly that leads you to what you are doing today. Um, I would like to kick off our conversation about what you are doing today, um, referring back to our first chat that we had before uh, before we talked today. And you commented on the image that I use on my social media, which is basically a vintage shot of women on a rowing boat. Yes. And you told me that images like that contribute to our misunderstanding of what teamwork should feel like. And I never thought about this, never had this perspective, and I found this fascinating. So can you share with our listeners why this imagery can be problematic? Yes. And, and of course, I love rowing and I love rowers. And I think the teamwork <laughs> required to row is, uh, is phenomenal. What I worry about is these images and the language that goes with them tend to make people believe that we're all supposed to be, as the, as the saying goes, rowing in the same direction, or we'll say we're all in the same boat. And what happens is when somebody has an idea where they're disagreeing or they uh, need to put some tension on a decision, I think there's a voice inside their head that thinks a good team player pulls in the same direction. Mm -hmm. And so they'll tend to withhold their comments. And for those who do share a comment that's a dissenting opinion, I think people on the receiving end of it feel like, you know, what a jerk, you know, aren't we all supposed to be pulling in the same direction? So this language and this metaphor of rowing gets in the way of us realizing that the, the role of a team is actually to bring different and divergent perspectives onto a problem. And in fact, to be pulling in different directions. So Mm -hmm. that's why I worry about about the rowers and how often our imagery, uh, and and we know how much language shapes our thought. And so uh, I worry that we become very conflict avoidant because of these, these images. Yeah, yeah. I I can see this now. I've never thought about this before because I think that there is a time in a team's life where they should be actually probably pulling in the same direction. But 
I, I, I can see why you say maybe we focus on this too early and we don't allow the space to have these um, debates and exchange different point of views. Um, so that makes total sense to me now. And I also remember from our previous conversation, this chat that we had about, you know, this tremendous focus that companies have had in the past years um, on creating a happy and harmonious workplace. And that's probably one, one of the reasons, again, that um, people sort of overdone this and were not allowing enough space for conflict. Would you, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, I think it is in organizations, certainly, if you look in the airport bookstores at all the popular books about management, so many of them have happiness in the title. But Mm -hmm. I think it's a broader cultural phenomenon where uh, we've come to believe in in 2019 that uh, happy we're all supposed to be happy, and I think it's a huge problem both in the workplace where we don't understand that there are going to be challenging times, difficult trade offs, uncomfortable conversations. It goes beyond that though to expecting that life is supposed to be happy or in mm. some way easy. So if we think about the the major uh, systemic challenges with mental health issues. I think if if we think that we're supposed to be happy all the time, the, the moment we feel uh, sad, we have stigmatized that. We've we've made it not a yeah. normal thing. So if you if you now zoom back into the conflict issue, if if we believe things are supposed to be happy and harmonious, then when someone starts pulling in a different direction than us, uh, we feel like our team is unhealthy, that mm-hmm. our relationship isn't sound, and and we become alarmist about problems happening instead of believing that. You know, that the primary condition of life is not intended to be happiness all the time. Yeah. Uh, you know, there are ups and downs. There are going to be difficult moments. And, and in the difficult moments and figuring out how to get through the difficult moments comes a lot of the meaning in our lives. So I'm really concerned that organizational cultures have been become too focused on happiness and harmony, and even that our societal culture has become too focused on happiness and harmony. Yeah. In fact, I, I go into in a bonus chapter in the book, I go into the danger of raising our children to see conflict as an unhealthy thing and how, you know, they aren't able to see conflict as a natural part of healthy relationships. So uh, I I am quite worried and quite alarmed about how our culture, both organizationally, but also more broadly is, is thinking, making us think that we should be able to expect happiness Mm. and harmony all the time. I really appreciate this perspective, Leanne, because conventional wisdom definitely has been that we we need to create those happy workplaces and happy societies, and it's a very popular um, narrative at the moment. Um, but but I totally agree with you. I think that it's a bit ridiculous that in the name of happiness we we become guilty almost and put more pressure even on ourselves um, when we don't feel those feelings. And as you say, also trying to create a harmonious environment in our teams. And and the result of that is that we cannot have truthful and um, effective conversations. Um, so, so you had this um, book recently published and the title is The Good Fight, Use of Productive Conflict to Get Your Team and Your Organization Back on Track. And, you know, I want to ask you, uh, having written one book already and now working on my second one, I know that um, it's not an easy decision to say, okay, I'm going to write a book now on this. So I'm wondering what was the point that made you feel, okay, there's a book there and I really need to write it because people need to read it. I guess the um, uh, the answer for public consumption would be <laughs> that uh, after writing my second book, uh, where I had one chapter about conflict, it became very clear in working with clients that I needed to go much more deeply mm. into conflict. But if I'm to give you the honest answer, because I, I do, it's a well, podcast, uh, you can say anything. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know, I feel like uh, I have this anonymity to, uh, to, to be honest, I, I wrote the book because I needed to read it. 
Mm, <laughs> and, and sometimes there's a message that yeah. uh, you you need and it, it doesn't exist in the world. So, you know, I do this to myself all the time. Uh, I am a conflict averse person. I have never liked conflict. So that wonderful family that taught me to be curious, which I am very, very grateful for, uh, also taught me to be conflict avoidant. We were not good at conflict in my family. Mm. So uh, in the early stages of my career, my conflict aversion started to affect me very, very early. And in my first job as a manager, I had a boss where we had a very unhealthy relationship. Uh, I felt I couldn't protect my team from her. I didn't know how to broach the subject with her or deal with it constructively. And I ended up quitting, just giving up Mm. and spending uh, quite a lot of time trying to figure out where was the organization that I could go to that didn't have conflict. And I inter- with, right. I, I laugh now. Yes, it's laughable now. But at the time, <laughs> I only worked in one organization, so it, it's impossible. And so I, I did. I found this amazing organization. And about two years later, the conflict set in again. And mm. that was the moment when I realized that Uh, every organization has conflict and I couldn't run from it. And instead I was going to have to stop and figure out how does a a conflict avoidant person learn to be good at conflict. And it's been a 10 year journey. And it was one of those opportunities where I said, there is no book that really gets to this, uh, these issues the way I think we need to get to these issues. And so if I want to read it, I guess I better write it. So mm. <laughs> that's been the last couple of years of my life. Yeah, I, I'm not surprised. I, I've i gotten a similar answer from, from other authors as well. I think it's very often the journey of an author that we feel like we we need to really embody a message and learn more about a topic. And so we dive really deep into it and we, we realize that there is a book there. Uh, and I'm so glad that you've written it because I have to say I'm definitely a conflict um, avoiding person as well. <laughs> so I, I love learning from you and I've learned a lot of useful stuff from your articles and your book. Um, one of the things that you say, which, which is pretty evident from our conversation uh, already in your book, and I'm going to read it out, is that unfortunately, you say, most humans don't embrace conflict. Rather, we avoid, postpone, evade, dug, dodge, and defer it. Um, so I'm curious, um, how yeah how can we normalize conflict because i think first is about overcoming that fear and that incredible feeling of discomfort even thinking about it um so what what what, what do you have to say to that how can we normalize it both in our lives in personal lives but also and particularly i think for our listeners it will be interesting to understand um what they can do in the workplace Yeah. So I think we need to spend a lot more time talking about how conflict is just a given in organizations. If there is an organization and, and frankly, if there's a relationship, there is going to be conflict. So the first thing is to just talk about it that way, that this is how it works. This is normal. So one of the things I start with is actually just defining conflict, because I think many of us hear the word conflict and imagine you know, war or, you know, Mm -hmm. very, very major conflict. And, and people will often, when I'm giving a speech, they'll, they'll raise their hand and say, you know, why do you even use that word? I don't think we should use that word. And I go back to the definition with people and I say, conflict is just the tension between opposing needs and wishes and demands. That's Mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And, and how many times a day, uh, you know, are there conflicting needs and wishes and demands? you know, in an organization, dozens. So, you know, when an organization sets strategy, you have to decide what are the markets we're going to play in and which ones are we not. And there's usually tension between, well, this would be a great market and it's rapidly growing, but oh, this market, you know, this is where we have so many of our existing customers and strengths. And then on our teams, uh, there's conflict every day. We have to allocate workload. Who gets the juicy, exciting, interesting assignment mm-hmm. and who, who gets the one that's, you know, a bit yeah. of a slog. And individually, we have to uh, put ourselves up for promotion and, and, you know, advocate for ourselves to get resources and development and 
So uh, the the most important thing we can do is talk about conflict, Mm -hmm. talk about what it is, what it isn't, talk about the value it brings. Mm -hmm. So just opening up the conversation and, and intentionally using the word conflict to be a little bit provocative so we can hear from people about what are their fears, what are their misperceptions about conflict. So making it something that's discussable instead of, I think, what it is in many organizations. It's undiscussable. Yeah, yeah, it's so true. It's such a loaded word. And yeah, I can completely see why people will say, why why do we really need to use this word? But I also understand why you insist on using the word, because it's almost like taking out the fear again, just using the word and talking about what it is and realizing that actually it's um, unavoidable and a lot of positive stuff can come out of it. Um, so I suppose the first stage, of course, is having a conversation about it and redefining it. And by the way, it just sort of strikes me how many of the things that trouble us today could benefit from redefining and, and really focusing on what are they really, even when, when I think about culture, which is our main topic here. Um, I think it all starts with understanding what we are really talking about. Yeah, absolutely. So, so. I suppose that it takes the right kind of mindset and the right skills to then deal with conflict effectively um, after you've understood it um, and and redefine it potentially. Um, So what have you found through your work in terms of how to develop this mindset and those skills? What I had to do is really go back. So it was great. Your question started with, you know, the culture of my early childhood. And and I think that's where we have to go back to, to understand our conflict aversion. Mm -hmm. So that's where I started my explorations was first of all, in understanding that biologically we are wired to get along with our, with our in-group because um, that was the primary human advantage as an animal Mm -hmm. throughout evolution was our ability to cooperate So we are wired to get along with those we saw as our own tribe. So first thing I had to understand was we are fighting a a biological (laughs) battle here in in trying to get people to safe if you are in conflict with your tribe members. Absolutely. Exactly. So I started there, but then I got into our socialization and our early years and the messages we hear. And so I'll I'll try and go quickly through four of them that I think are very Mm -hmm. interesting. The first, and, and perhaps this is because I'm a Canadian, although I've encountered it in many other places in the world, my Canadian grandma used to say, if you can't say something nice, don't yeah. say anything at all. Same in Poland. And so we, okay, good. Yeah. So we yeah. learned very early. How do you say it in Polish? <laughs> nie mów nic złego o kimś, jeżeli nie masz nic dobrego. Nie, uh, sorry. Uh, okay. Let me rewind because actually that's yeah, not yeah. it. Um, lepiej jest nic nie mówić, niż mówić coś złego o kimś. I think I need to learn to say that phrase in all different languages because <laughs> it, I think it exists in all different languages. Yeah. So we learned that um, we should only say nice things. So yeah. so that's interesting. Um, and then there was this second voice in my head that I think about all the time from childhood when you would say something that would make another kid cry. Mm. And immediately you would get in trouble. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so you learn that emotions must be bad because this adult is angry. I'm in trouble. And, and secondly, you learn that somebody else's emotions are your fault. So we're supposed to take ownership of other people's feelings. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that can make us very uh, fearful of mm-hmm. triggering emotion in someone. Um, a third one, very commonly associated with school teachers, is mind your own business. So we learned if it, if the issue doesn't directly involve us, then we shouldn't uh, speak up. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then finally, the, what I associate with sort of dads and, and f- a father figure around be good and stay out of trouble. So don't challenge your teacher. Don't challenge your coach. Uh, don't, right? Mm-hmm. So we have uh, all these voices whispering in our ear even as adults that come from very, very early days that make us believe that conflict is impolite, um, that it's inappropriate. And of course, for you and I, that it's not ladylike, that (laughs) that ladies don't Mm -hmm. have conflict. So one of the things I do in the book is go after these preconceived notions. So going after the idea that conflict isn't nice and instead saying that 
Well, but in many cases, it's kind. So we might take an example of giving someone in our organization feedback. Maybe their their uh, dry run of their presentation wasn't very good, and we don't want to say anything because it's not nice. But it's also very much not kind to leave the person uh, doing the presentation the next time and doing it poorly. Absolutely. So it's more kind to give the person mm-hmm. feedback. Um if we think about the emotional issue, um, talking about emotions now, not as unprofessional or inappropriate in the workplace, but just a natural part of the way our brain interacts with the world and helping people understand that if we can uh, talk about emotions, if we can deal with them as just another data set, just like thoughts, um, that we can uh, have much, much less drama in the workplace because we're not trying to deny emotions. So helping people realize that the best place for an emotion is out (laughs) where we can deal with it and work with it. Um, The mind your own business, helping people develop a mindset of realizing that if two people are in a fight, neither of them is very well positioned to get to the other side of the fight because they are emotionally invested. And in fact, it's the person with a little bit of distance from the issue that's in a much better position to help them look at it in a new way or to reframe it. So minding your own business to me is very, very ineffective. And in fact, you want to help your teammates. So you know, working on these ways of helping people change their mindset by going one at a time after these preconceived notions Mm. that we've had since we were children. So that was one of the things that really motivated me to write the book. I've seen so many great books about how to have conflict. So difficult conversations, fierce conversations, these are excellent books, Mm -hmm. but they, I see organization after organization run their employees through this training And so build up these wonderful skills for for having conflict and never address the fact that the people don't want to have conflict in the first place because of that biological wiring, because of how they're socialized. So they have this great skill set that they're not using. Mm -hmm. So I wanted the good fight to go back way before the difficult conversation to get at our mindset, to help us become more aware and to change this view that conflict isn't nice or it isn't polite or it isn't ladylike. And in fact, to believe that conflict is the most productive thing we can do yeah. because then we don't. So I talk about it in the book as conflict debt when we get stuck right. with all these mm. issues because we don't know how to get to the other side of it. So so much of the, the first section of, of the good fight is really going after our mindset because it doesn't matter how good our mm. skill set is. If, if we don't have the mindset to believe that conflict is part of my obligation and part of being a good team player, we're yeah. not going to use those conflict skills. I love that. And I would like us to say with two things that, that you've mentioned here, because I think they're just so important. And you completely blow my mind when you say, you know, it's one thing to be nice and one thing to be kind. And I think it's so, so true. And very often we, we fail at being kind simply because we want to be nice. So I just want to flash it out for yes. our listeners because, you know, when you, when you yes. think about this this way, uh, of course, you, you think, duh, of course, it's more important to be kind <laughs> than to be nice. Um, yes. But but sometimes we just don't realize that this is exactly what we're doing. We're just trying to be nice and we're not being kind. Um, and I yeah. recently what had a realization big- that I did this again to someone. Yeah. I know. <laughs> so it's hard. I, I, I think it's really hard to change these behaviors because it's such a strong pull, as you say, of those deeply rooted beliefs. Um, so yeah, it's, it's so important to talk about that. Yeah. One of the things that I think is interesting and different between nice and kind is nice is easy for us usually, fairly easily. Mm -hmm. We can paste on a false smile and we can say something nice. Being kind takes candor often. And so I've just created my own definition of candor uh, to help people think about this kindness. So candor for me is my willingness to be uncomfortable for your benefit. Mm -hmm. And that's a kind person, a person who is willing to be uncomfortable for someone else's benefit. And so nice is easy. 
kind sometimes requires candor, yeah. sometimes requires discomfort, but those are the people for whom we hold out the greatest trust, the greatest respect, the greatest love is people who are willing to be uncomfortable for our benefit. I love that. And this is this is exactly, I think, this notion of vulnerability that Brene Brown talks about. Yes where you really have to be brave to be so honest with someone, but it is the ultimate act of love and of care, I think. Um, but as I say, yes, it's so she, I get goosebumps mm-hmm. when I think about yeah. her, you know, yeah. her, her work is, and, and similar to me, she's somebody who um, went deeply into the stuff that made her most uncomfortable. Mm. So for her, it wasn't conflict, it was vulnerability, but the willingness to really uh, explore and sit in the discomfort of vulnerability is the very much the parallel to, to what yeah. it felt like for me to sit in the discomfort of conflict. Mm-hmm. So she's really one of my heroes yes, for, for sure. me too. I, I completely agree. So yeah, so that was the one thing that I wanted us to pause and really think about this difference between being nice and kind. And that the second one, as you were speaking, I realized, you know, it's so similar to what I'm finding in my work around culture, because this is a sort of now commonly accepted um, practice that if you want to change culture or belief rather um, in in this field, that if you want to change culture, you have to start with behaviors and then people will eventually engage in those behaviors and their their beliefs will change as a result. And I tried to adapt this um, as, as my way of working with clients, but it just didn't work. And, you know, sometimes people will comply with certain behaviors without changing their beliefs for a while. But then if there is no not enough support, they will just go back to the old way of doing things. So I, I've realized um, that um, you really have to address and talk about those norms, what they are. So in this case, is really um, identifying what do I believe about conflict, but organizations collectively, they have similar norms as well. And it's really important, I think, to identify and then talk about this. And so speaking of Speaking of conflict, I, I just want to share with you and with our listeners um, how I got scared with one client recently, and it was because of our first conversation. So I, I'm um, now in in uh, the process of doing a culture project, and I was interviewing the senior leadership team and doing focus groups, and we were also running a culture diagnostic. And one of the findings that was very, very consistent across the board was that people feel really proud about um, the deep relationships that they create and also the harmony in the relationships. And specifically to the question, what do you value more than profits? A consistent answer was harmony. (laughs) <laughs> and it just completely freaked me out <laughs> and I thought uh oh that's going to be difficult <laughs> yes oh that's fascinating mm. that's really fascinating and and I think it's wonderful that they have been open yeah. about that um, and it gives you a sense of what an uphill battle mm. creating productive conflict will be I, I think what's interesting is Often, if I'm having a private conversation with someone and I say to them, why didn't you raise that challenging issue in front of the team? And they said, well, you know, I don't want my teammates to to not trust me. Mm -hmm. I said, that's so interesting. Tell me who in your life you trust the most. And of course, they go to lists of people who were willing to be candid with them, who were transparent, Mm -hmm. who cared enough about them to say the difficult thing. And I'll say... So if those are the people you trust the most, why is it that you behave in, in the opposite way in order to maintain trust with other people? We, we really have it backwards. So I agree with you that we have to go back and explore the norms and where these things come from because we have it very backward. Yeah. We, we think that being less than honest with people, less than candid with people uh, will protect their trust in us mm-hmm. when, of course, it makes yeah. us the least trustworthy person around. And so sometimes, of course, it's very difficult to question these norms because they're so deeply rooted in our psyche that that we 
probably very often need someone to challenge us or to sort of put a mirror in front of our face or engage us in a conversation, which I think is where the role of a lot of our listeners is because being a leader, being a team leader, uh, I imagine that that um, you see this this way as well. It's one of the important conversations that a leader could and should have with their team members is why do we believe this and what do we believe about those things? Do, do you find that a leader can do those things with their own team or would you say that they need external help to help these conversations around what do we believe about conflict and how we can start navigate, navigating conflict more effectively? I think a, a new team, so a leader having some kind of change on the team, some excuse to revisit how they operate, what their beliefs are. Uh, I think a, a new leader is in a very good position to facilitate that conversation themselves. I, I think the big challenge is if you have an existing mm -hmm. team and that existing yeah. team um, <laughs> Uh, you know, you've already behaved in a way that, uh, you know, makes it clear that conflict is not, doesn't come easily mm -hmm. or, or any kind of culture change. That's when I think you mm -hmm. tend to need outside help. Yeah. But uh, a lot of my work and, and a lot of the good fight just gives you all of my exercises mm -hmm. so that if you are a team leader starting out a new team, you can do yeah. it without needing any help. Yeah. Um, it, it's only once you've maybe got yourself into some bad behavior. Yes. <laughs> Uh, yes, then yeah. maybe it's best to Absolutely. leave it to the and I think we're all well, all uh, really prone to this cultural blindness. I call it sometimes. So we, being part of the system, it's like the fish that can't see the water because it's such a natural yes. part of our environment that we just stop yeah. questioning those things anymore. Um, so it makes total sense to me. So let's talk about the exercises. I'm very excited that we have this opportunity to share this with our listeners um, yeah. because I think based on the feedback from people who listen, um, they always say, you know, we love getting some practical tips of what we can do differently. Um, so I love one of the exercises that you described, which is around, you know, how can you um, uh, help people feel more comfortable with conflict in a team setting? Mm -hmm. This is a conversation mm -hmm. about roles. Could you walk our listeners through this exercise? I would love to. So when I started complaining about the rowers, I figured I couldn't just complain and not have an alternative. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I set to work trying to find an alternative. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a long involved story that goes with it in the book where I talk about um, a, a time as a family when we were camping and there was a big rainstorm coming. And so we needed to get a big sheet of plastic and spread it out over our tent to try and protect it from the rain. And so we had sort of four ropes on the four corners of this big sheet of plastic. And we were trying to make the piece of plastic as big and as tight as we could mm -hmm. and get it centered over the tent. And, and all of a sudden I had an image yeah. where we were a team, but we were pulling in, in totally different directions. And in fact, putting tension on one another. Um, so this is where the, this new exercise came from. So so uh, essentially what we have people do is we draw, uh, it, because most teams have more than four uh, rolls on them, we draw mm -hmm. it as a circle and then we put, uh, we put a rope coming out of each of the segments of the team. So if you are a team of eight, let's say, um, including the team leader, then you're going to put seven sections in a circle on a flip chart or on a whiteboard. And you're going to go around and for each role, you're going to answer three questions. So the first thing you're going to answer, take one role. So perhaps you choose your head of sales yeah. and you say, what is the unique value that this role brings to our decisions and our discussions? Mm -hmm. So for sales, you would say that um, they bring a very uh, intimate view of the customer, right? They know what the customer wants. They, they are focused on um, how to talk about the product. So that's another key thing that sales is doing. They're trying to create the flexibility to meet different customers' needs. So that's the unique lens that sales is bringing. Yeah. They're thinking about the benefits of the product. Mm -hmm. So that's the first question. The second question is, what's the stakeholder that this role is particularly focused on? Mm -hmm. And in the case of sales, obviously it's yeah. customers and prospective customers. And then the third question is, what's the tension that this role puts on our discussions. Mm. And with sales, they usually 
want something new and shiny, yeah. <laughs> something exciting. Um, and then you go to the next role. And let's take one that's a, a good example of opposition. Let's take operations yes. uh, who may mm-hmm. sit at the same table. It's okay, what's the unique value of operations? And of course, they're focused on efficiency and consistency and standardization. And you say, okay, what's the stakeholder that they're focused on? And operations is usually focused on internal stakeholders. Uh, and then we say, what's the tension that operations needs to put on our discussions? Well, they're trying to standardize things. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All of a sudden, everyone in the room kind of looks at each other and you look at the salesperson and the operations person, you say, how's that going? (laughs) (laughs) And they tend to laugh because immediately now Mm. it's clear that these two roles are not pulling in the same direction. They're pulling in very, very different directions. And so- and, and that's what they're supposed to be mm-hmm. doing. And then when you move to human resources and, and you ask mm-hmm. them, the unique value they're bringing is they're looking at the impact of, of decisions on the talent, on the culture. And you say, what's your stakeholder? And they say, the employees. And, and you talk about what's the tension you're putting on things? And they're saying, well, how's it going to impact our engagement and our culture? And, mm-hmm. and you move to the risk function who's looking at completely different things. Yeah. And of course, everyone laughs when you get to the finance person. <laughs> um, and, and so it is a miraculous exercise mm-hmm. Because once you get to the other side, people start to realize that what they had been interpreting as friction when we have difficult conversations where we disagree, and and they'd been interpreting as friction that was wearing them down, they now see as tension that makes the whole, in this case, if you think about this big piece of plastic covering the tent, tension on those different corners makes it bigger, makes the profit bigger, makes the value Mm. bigger. Um, So it's, it's really magical. And people begin to realize, I say, I go back to this silly story of, of camping. And I say, you know, at one point, my husband sort of pulled a little too hard on his corner and he ripped the rope (laughs) right out of the, the metal hole in the tarp. And I say, you know, that happens on your team sometimes, Mm -hmm. doesn't it? When one person, either because they're a stronger personality or because they come from a function that has more power in the organization, they can pull the whole thing off target. And and that doesn't help much if the whole piece of plastic is, you know, only covering half of the tent because, you know, sales pulled it too far in one direction. And and then, you know, the other thing that happens, which did happen in our story when my nine-year-old daughter at the time let go of her corner and the whole piece of plastic flew up and left the corner of the tent getting soaked in the yeah. pouring rain. And, and that happens too, where somebody on the team is, doesn't like conflict or is more introverted or uh, comes from a function with less power in the organization. And so they just stop pulling. And you find that somehow the organization is exposed. Mm-hmm. There's an issue or risk that's not addressed. So when you go through this exercise with your team and everyone becomes clear, not only of their own obligation, but how that could and should be in tension with with others, then you have normalized this. Mm. So it's very fun when it so in, in English, this the word for this piece of plastic is a tarpaulin, uh, or the short form is a tarp. And so when I do it with organizations, one of the clients I worked with, he said, oh, Leanne, we've been doing a lot of tarping. <laughs> he turned it into a verb. And, and that just means we're, we're putting tension on issues. We're seeing it from very different perspectives. And uh, it, it's great because then people know, oh, this is good. This is healthy. This is what we're supposed to be doing. So this exercise is the best hour you can spend on your team to create a culture of productive conflict. I just, I I really hope the listeners will invest the time to do it with their teams. I really love that. I have two reflections on on what you've shared. I think the first thing that strikes me is that through the simple exercise, you give people the gifts of empathy, basically, because they can really put themselves in the shoes of their colleagues, probably for the first time in months or perhaps even years. And it's also not just telling them, but showing them in the moment. 
and I think probably that's why it generates a, a lot of laughter, as you say, and and yes. um, <laughs> people can really react to this in the moment. So I love that. And in terms of imagery, another thing that came to my mind was that the same mechanics work with an umbrella, right? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. So so yeah, absolutely. There are there are certain things that benefit more from actually this this tension creating this tension rather than the other way around. Makes total sense to me now. Thank you. Um and I think that that's a really simple exercise that all of our listeners can can do with their teams. Um and I also love your technique of validating and pivoting when we face a disagreement <laughs> with a colleague at work. And um, I, I would really love you to be able to share that with our listeners as well. Um, because I think sometimes those one-to-one -one conversations when someone catches us off guard and we, we are not prepared to deal with that situation are very often... Um, situations where we, in spite of our best intentions, we shy away from conflict. But thinking about this technique of validating and pivoting, um, I think if you, if you think about those two things, you are more prepared. And then I imagine that these conversations probably can go much better. Yeah. So you can train yeah. yourself. So when someone says something we disagree with, our natural tendency is for most of us, even conflict avoidant people, we tend to mm -hmm. contradict. So we'll say, no, no, that's not true. Or no, I think it should be, you say apple and I say orange yeah. or that sort of thing. And so uh, we invalidate mm -hmm. the person by not listening to them, by not um, giving them an indication that we hear them. So invalidating someone tends to make them more aggressive, mm -hmm. tends to, uh, you know, get us into a fight that's not I a healthy I have an example fight. from a recent so in, workshop just to illustrate okay, okay, that for our listeners how that yeah, could flow in, a, in the specific situation. So I actually had a senior leadership team there and the conversation was whether um, the company was clear and aligned around its strategy. And there were some team members, including the CEO, who felt like absolutely they are and it's just a matter of communication and there were some other team members who said I don't think so I don't think that we've really clarified what our strategy really is and there's there's definitely some work to be done there so that was the okay, yeah let's use that one. immediate let's use reaction that no Great. you are okay. not right we don't have a clear strategy and you know it's it's not there and we really need to do some more work so how would you handle that if you were the CEO Perfect. Okay. So if the person has just said that we have, yes, we have a clear strategy and you completely mm -hmm. disagree. So what you want to say, no, we don't, yeah. there's no way people yeah. have no idea. Right? But instead if you say, okay, so you, you believe we have a clear strategy. So validating is very simple. It's usually just repeating. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the, the CEO says, we have a clear strategy. You say, you believe we have a clear strategy and, and say mm -hmm. it calmly. And it just says, I heard you. I'm going to listen to you before I start talking. Um, there are other ways you can validate. Uh, one of the ways is if somebody says something very uncomfortable, you can say something like, I'm really glad you mm. said that, or we needed to get that on the table. Or in this case with the, we have a clear strategy, you know, uh, I'm glad you've brought that up. I think we mm -hmm. need to talk about our strategy. I love that. So basically so you, you demonstrate that you've heard it and you acknowledge yes. the, the person's viewpoint. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the next step is to ask a question. So show that you're curious um, because curiosity is the antidote to defensiveness. Mm -hmm. So being curious is great. So you say, okay, what are some of the things that you've heard recently that give you confidence that the strategy is, mm -hmm. is clear? You could just ask it that way. Um, and, and what's interesting is as the person answers that question, <laughs> Um, so they may say all of their examples might be, well, we have the 17 page PowerPoint presentation that outlines our strategy. And we spent six days as a team defining mm -hmm. our strategy. And if that's the case, you're getting the sense that the CEO is defining clear strategy as something that exists mm -hmm. in PowerPoint, right? Um, so that's useful. So first validate, just say, you believe we have a clear strategy. Second, ask some questions to understand where they're mm -hmm. coming from. And once you've done that, then you can actually, what I talk about is say their truth. 
So for you, we have, we've invested six days. We have got to a document that we all agree with and we've all signed on to, uh, and, and that makes the strategy clear. So the secret of validating and pivoting is that their truth comes out of your mouth before your truth mm. does. So you haven't said anything about your truth yet, but now you've earned the right to say your truth. So for you, we've spent six days on this. We've got a, a document that we all agree with. Then you can add your truth. And the pivot looks like this. For me, I'm actually thinking about um, how when I shared the document with my team, they interpreted uh, you know, this point about competitive advantage to mean X. But I was just talking with, um, with Jean and Jean was telling me his team interpreted it mm-hmm. as Y. So I'm actually thinking about how there are still terms that we haven't mm-hmm. defined or we haven't got to the point of, of how the strategy plays out at the next level down. So that's for me why I'm saying we don't have a clear strategy. I mm-hmm. agree with you that we, we have the document where I'm paying attention is to how that cascades to the next level. So now you've added your truth. So once you have two truths, then you can say, so where do you think we go from here? And in fact, the CEO probably doesn't disagree that in in getting it to the next layer, there might be some challenges. So you're actually now problem solving about strategy cascade as allies instead of fighting about whether there is or isn't a strategy as adversaries. So this is such a valuable technique. And and I joke about how this works just as well at home. So if you think about how often, you know, your partner walks through the door and says, I had the worst day. And you go, oh, you think your day was bad. Wait till you hear about my day. And it's the exact same invalidation when instead of you said, you did, what made it so bad? And they told you and you said, oh, well, what did you do then? And asked a couple Mm. questions and then you said, so it was one of those days where you really aren't proud of, you know, the product that you put out. I I know you hate that. Maybe it was a full moon because I had a terrible day too. (laughs) And then you can say, hey, what do you think? Should we, you know, uh, crack a bottle of wine and watch some Netflix? Mm -hmm. So it's exactly the same at home, but we tend to invalidate people. And if we just took the moment to validate them, ask a couple questions to show our curiosity, and then we stated their truth before pivoting to our own truth, our lives would be much, much better places. Mm-hmm. I couldn't <laughs> agree more. And there are, you know, two um, n- nuances here in this technique that strike me as really important. One is around being really curious. Um, so you say that, you know, uh, we when we acknowledge and validate the truth of the other person, then we need to ask questions. I think it's so important to really bring genuine curiosity to that questioning. Um, because sometimes when people try to implement techniques, they will just go through the emotions without having the mindset and, you know, the open mind of curiosity. And I think the danger is that the the other party is going to sense that and maybe even interpret that as um, sarcasm or um, something of that sort. Um, So it's important. I think it's important for me that you underline, use curiosity, be open, find out. And then what strikes me, Leanne, in what you have just shared with us is you said two truths. And I think we are wired to believe also, so going back again to those norms and beliefs that we carry with us, that there's only one truth. And so what your proposition is, no, there can be two truths and they can both be valid, right? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, on the first point about uh, the authenticity with which you are curious, and I encourage people that if you are feeling something, don't hide it. So if the boss says, you know, I think we have a really clear strategy, you can say, you believe that we have a really clear strategy. You know, that's really surprising for me. Um, You know, I'm struggling with that. I, I, I'm struggling to reconcile that. So, you know, okay, help me understand mm-hmm. it or, or tell me more about what. And so instead of being false 
and, yeah. and you know, pretending mm. that we're not frustrated by the point or that we're not wrestling with it. Be authentic yeah. about it. Just say that doesn't compute for mm-hmm. me. And so I, and, and that's why mm-hmm. I need to understand more. That's why you need to tell me more. So being authentic in, in your questioning. And if you're, if your answer is that is really hard for me to hear, yeah. or that is so demoralizing mm-hmm. for me. So I need you to, you know, help me understand it or whatever. I find it so much easier not to be that looking manipulative if we're just transparent mm-hmm. about how we feel. Yeah. So that's a, another thing we can add to the validation mm-hmm. technique is just be honest about how it's affecting yeah, you. Yeah, I love that. Um, and again, I think it goes goes against the conventional wisdom, <laughs> being honest in the workplace. Hello, yes. <laughs> is that correct? Yes, limiting I move, know, right? But if you do it, if you do yeah. it well, I I I can completely see how this is actually the only way to um, have meaningful conversations that can lead to some constructive outcomes. Um, so, if you were to, I know that there are so many things that our listeners can do, <laughs> but if you were just to narrow it down to three things that they could yeah. do to foster a culture of productive conflict. What what would you say those three things should be? So I would say the first one is just talk about it. So talk about what are the most difficult conversations we need to have? What are the conflicts that our team is counting on us or our organization or our customers are counting on us to work through? How do we want to handle that? So just a conversation about what is the role of conflict on our team and how do we want to handle it is great. Second, I think do that TARP exercise mm-hmm. that we talked about, right? Go through, map out the roles. Talk, that's incredibly valuable. And then the third one is, I think just start to practice. So sprinkle little bits of conflict (laughs) so you can start to build up the muscle. So, um, you know, instead of when someone says something, everyone just goes along, try adding a little tension to it. So, oh, that's interesting that you think that, you know, what are some of the uh, facts that, you know, you're basing that Mm -hmm. on? Um, Or, okay, that, you know, I get why that would be really great from a finance perspective. How do you think it would land in operations? So you can, you know, add a different stakeholder, or you can say, I love that plan. That's amazing. And and it's going to be amazing when we're the first to market. And I'm, I'm just wondering, what happens if by some chance we're not the first to market? How, how would we do it then? So just little things you can do to not just be nodding all the mm-hmm. time and being harmonious, but instead to just put a little bit of tension. And that way the team starts to build up the muscle around um, dealing with things that would otherwise feel confronting. Mm-hmm. And uh, and in this, way, in this way, they'll start to get accustomed to, we don't yeah. just put an idea on the table and then all nod and yeah, go along yeah. with it. That's wonderful. And it, it sort of reminded me of my conversation with Wes Cow. And she she used to work, um, she's a marketing strategist now, and she used to work with Seth Godin, who I hugely admire. And he's he's an upcoming yes. guest on, <laughs> on Culture Lab. I'm so oh, excited um, to finally wonderful. speak to him. And she um, shared a little bit, you know, of the what's happening in, in his company. Um, she was a program director, I think, um, when she was working with him. Mm. And she talked about how he also sets clear expectations around how he wanted and encouraged people to challenge him, um, even mm-hmm. when you just joined the team. And I think that that's such a wonderful illustration of small, relatively small things that you can do as people join your team to say, you know, I really expect you to challenge me and, and um start creating that tension that, as you say, is healthy in a team. So role modeling that by by encouraging the others to be challenged, I think is a good idea for leaders as well. This is all wonderful. I wish we could speak longer, Leanne. You have so many <laughs> wonderful things to, to share with our listeners. I truly deeply believe that this is such an important topic. Um, but I want to be respectful of your time. So I want us to move on to the rapid fire questions. And okay, I'm okay, ready. Okay, fantastic. Five, <laughs> five <laughs> questions, and we have two minutes to answer all of them. And the first one is about your definition of organizational culture. What is it? Ooh, that's a hard <laughs> one. <laughs> um, 
uh, the unwritten mm-hmm. rules. And what would you say are the signs that a company culture needs some work or perhaps even a major overhaul? Oh, that one's easy for me, <laughs> yeah. right? Because I got to say it's when there's, when the uncomfortable things aren't being mm-hmm. discussed. So I immediately, when everything, when people say we're really nice and we're all that, I'm uh oh, because as soon as I see that the uncomfortable conversations aren't being had, then I know there's no trust and I know that everything is a bit superficial. Mm-hmm. So that's easy for me. As soon as I walk in and everything is just too mm-hmm. happy, then, then I know the culture is in trouble. I that. Was a very counterintuitive, and <laughs> and um, what is a company that you truly admire for their culture? I was really fortunate to get to do some work with Amazon, and Amazon's culture is a uh, culture conflict is a very important part of their culture. So they have the rule of disagree. Mm-hmm and commit. So they have the two healthy sides. So you have an obligation to disagree, find something in which you can put Mm -hmm. tension on a discussion. And once the decision is made, you have an obligation to commit and and make that decision Mm -hmm. successful. And they don't just put that on the wall. They live Mm -hmm. that. It is very much apparent in their organization. And I very much Mm -hmm. admire them for that. Wonderful. And what are the books on culture and leadership that you would recommend? And clearly, uh, we'd recommend both of your books. And we're going to post the links um, in the show notes to both of your books. Um, But aside your books, are there any books that you believe would really be helpful for our listeners, perhaps on culture, on leadership, on conflict? Yeah, I'm going to recommend a leadership book. And the book is called The Leadership Contract Mm -hmm. by Vince Molinaro. And Vince is a friend of mine and a former colleague. And he takes this really interesting notion. And he says that, you know, being a leader is a really important profession as many others. But the way our organizations work, we never actually have this moment where we sign on to become a leader. And so he goes through, what are the terms and conditions of this leadership contract that we sign without knowing we're signing it? And it's very, very, very interesting and thought provoking for a leader to think about. And and so he uses this metaphor of just like when you're on the web and you, you want something and you click agree to the terms and conditions without ever reading them. So he says leaders want the promotion motion and want the corner office. And so they just sort of click agree to the leadership contract without ever knowing what they're signing Mm -hmm. up for. So if more leaders could read the leadership contract, be more aware and more deliberate about what they've signed up for, I think we'd have much healthier leadership cultures in our organization. So I'm going to encourage folks to to get the leadership contract and uh, and really, and it's available in many languages Mm now and, and to really think about it. it it's a, such an important Wonderful. idea. I'm adding it to my personal list as well because I haven't I haven't heard of it. So thank you. Um, so finally, one um, last question in this series is about one thing that you would say our listeners should probably do tomorrow um, to build their own culture lab. And what I mean by that is we encourage our listeners to experiment with, with things um, so that they can see what works and what doesn't work in terms of shaping a culture that will eventually get them to whatever vision they have for their business and for their teams. Um, so what's a, what sort of experiments or experiment would you recommend our listeners um, carry out um, tomorrow or the day after tomorrow? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I would say have the conversation about your team's own ground rules for healthy conflict. Mm-hmm. So just say, if we could have three rules, I had one client, it was very interesting. They, they, the CEO wanted more conflict on the team and and he defined it as like jousting, the medieval sport of <laughs> jousting. And he said, you know, they, there's such clear rules about jousting mm-hmm. to make it a fair fight. He said, we sometimes need to have jousting time. And so they actually set this language of jousting time and they defined their rules of jousting mm-hmm. time. And it was really 
really great because it allowed them, and they actually ended up getting these little cards printed that anybody could throw at any moment to say, okay, we're, the rules are applying. Here we go. I love that. And it was really mm-hmm. valuable. Yeah, it was really cool. And so doing that, just say, okay, let's set our three or four uh, rules for this is how we have conflict. And it's such an easy thing to do. You could do in 10 minutes with your team, but I think it would make all mm-hmm. the difference. It's wonderful. And it, it really nicely illustrates also how important sometimes those rituals can be if you want to shift your culture. Because when you have these tools, like as you say, th- being able to throw a card on the table and then say rules apply as discussed, it's such a simple thing to do, but also it really gives people the right to um, shift gears in the conversation and do something different from what they used to do a few years ago. So I I love that idea. Um, So um, I would also like to um, ask you whether you have a great guest um, that you could recommend I interview on the podcast. So there's somebody who I have met recently who I think is fascinating. So her name is Melissa Agnes, and her specialty is building crisis-ready organizations. Mm. And I think the whole notion of a crisis-ready culture. So she works with, you know, major law enforcement agencies or um, organizations like shipping companies Mm -hmm. that, you know, that could have a, but I think in today's world, every organization is one moment away from a crisis, whether that be their, their entire customer database Mm -hmm. is hacked or, uh, you know, there's an act of terrorism that affects them. Um, The, the Maersk organization last year, the global shipping company where they have had a um, ransomware or a virus get in and all but for one computer in no. Africa where the power was out, they would have lost the entire ability to oh manage the company. It's, it's a yeah. great story. If you haven't read it, you know, look it up. So Melissa helps um, leaders and organizations build a crisis ready culture. And I think it's such an interesting topic you might like to it explore. Is. I love it. And it's really close to my work. Mm-hmm. I'm sensing because I recently discovered, uh, well, not so recently, but doing my research, um, I've discovered that what makes a difference nowadays in organizations and what really only matters when when it comes to culture is whether your culture is adaptable or um, an adapt adaptive uh, or maladaptive. Yeah. And so I think that's that's very similar to um, what you described in her work. Um, so I'd love to speak to her. Yeah. Would you be able to introduce yeah. us? Yeah. Of course, absolutely. I would love to. Um, (laughs) So in closing, um, Leanne, is there anything that a message last words that you'd like to leave our listeners with? Maybe I'll share my mantra because you and I are both conflict avoidant (laughs) and I know so many of the listeners are conflict avoidant. So I'll tell you the mantra that I have had to just start telling myself, some things are worth fighting for. And when I say that to myself, I still get goosebumps Mm -hmm. when I say it, because I realize that uh, there are things, many, many things worth fighting for in this world. And so we got to get good at having a good fight. It it shouldn't be an unhealthy one. But if we can have a good fight, there are many things worth Mm -hmm. fighting for. I love that. And I think when we focus on that, what we're fighting for, rather than fighting, fighting against something, it really makes it easier. At least it would make it easier for me. Um, so I love that. Thank you so much. I can't, I can't think of a better way to end this, um, interview. And probably the only thing that I'd like to ask you now is to direct our listeners to where they can find more about you, about your work, what would be the best places to connect with you? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the easiest way to find me is leannedavy.com, which sounds very easy, except that the spelling of my name is just <laughs> impossible. So it's L-I-A-N-E. D-A-V-E-Y.com. So LeanneDavy.com. And, you know, I love to interact with people on LinkedIn. I have Dr. Leanne Davy on Facebook. Wherever works for them, I'm probably there. Uh, Instagram is the behind the scenes look at what my crazy life looks like. So 
um, whichever way people like to engage, uh, they they can certainly connect with me. And I would love it. I just love uh, not only hearing people's stories, but I love getting people's questions about what's the next thing I should address on my blog or what's the mm-hmm. predicament that they would like some help to get through. So um, please, uh, I encourage all the listeners to send in either your own experiences and stories or your questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Leanne. Thank you so much for your time and being so generous with sharing the tools and the ideas that our listeners can use with their teams. And uh, I would also encourage you to tag me or or uh, let me know how um, things have been going in terms of experimenting with uh, these techniques that Leanne has shared with us. Uh, it would be wonderful to know whether it's working for you and what has changed. So let us know. Um, and and um, yeah, just, just be in touch as always. I'm Aga Bayer, the creator and host of the Culture Lab podcast, and this is the Culture Lab team. Production manager, Lindsay Nunez. Art director, Emily Spencer. Aaron Scott, content editor. Sound producer, James Ead, Be Heard. And now, as usual, I want to give you a preview of my next interview. My next guest is Jos de Bloch. Jos is the founder and CEO of BoardTorg, which is a Dutch organization with more than 10,000 employees. BoardTorg offers community-based care services to more than 70,000 patients a year. And there are a lot of amazing things about BoardTorg, but what's really mind-blowing is the fact that it operates without a single manager. Here is Jos de Bloch, talking about the foundations of Borzorg culture. I think the culture is based on common sense, um, on professional ethics, um, and on a clear purpose. So for me, these are the important things. And I don't want to make it bigger than it is, because it's it's about very simple principles. Um, so it's it's about um, trying to do meaningful things for people who need it. Thank you for listening to this episode of Culture Lamp. If you found any moments that were interesting, inspiring, or maybe even game-changing, please share it with someone who'd appreciate it. After all, good ideas are meant to be shared. <laughs>